gonna be crazy. Yeah, it is. All right, today I got a special guest for y'all because this is gonna be crazy. I got someone here. His name's Tyrone. <laughs> no, I'm just messing. I'm gonna let him introduce himself to you in a minute. But he actually has a real e-commerce business, and he and he's got a belt. <laughs> he's got a belt. A in fact, <laughs> all right, just go ahead and introduce yourself to the folks. Hey everybody, my name is uh, Tyron Spear, and um, and I basically launch uh, e-commerce businesses. So right now I have e-commerce business doing about a hundred thousand dollars a month, and uh, I was doing so well that I won this belt by Ezra Firestone by pushing $100,000 worth of just upsells uh, through his app. So I ranked in the top 10% um, using his app, like all time sales of his app. And, uh, and I won this award, won the belt. All right, so let's see. You you can keep talking, like, you know, just talk about yourself, what okay. you did. Because how long have you been in e-commerce? So I've been in e-commerce since, uh, September, since September 2013. So I started off with uh, with ASM, so like Amazing Selling Machine, and I was on Amazon platform all the way up until um, all up until maybe like December of 2016, and then I made a transition over to Shopify. So I started running ads directly from Facebook into um, into uh, Shopify, and then I just scaled from there. Okay, all right. Yeah. Let's talk about. What was your experience like with the Amazing Selling Machine? Amazing Selling Machine. <laughs> so, thank. So, thankfully, I had a skill set prior to Amazing Selling Machine. Whoa, whoa slow it down, slow it down. <laughs> what do you mean a skill set? So, um, in 2010, I started doing SEO. So, I was in the SEO world. Uh, did a lot of black hat SEO. And uh, all right, whoa, 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 whoa. We got to slow you down a little bit. <laughs> slow you down a little bit. Oh, boy. Now, what's this black hat stuff? I mean, because you got to understand, everybody does not know the term, the terms okay. that you're you're using. Everybody right. doesn't know that. Okay. So, so black hat is more so like, um, uh, you know, you have like hackers on the internet and so on and so forth, and basically they just have a philosophy that everything on the internet should be free. That's pretty much their philosophy. So these guys basically use code or use different hacks to gain access to information. And that's their biggest thing, and and they're and they're real testers. So they test different things on the internet. They're trying to figure out how the algorithm works and how to best to game any and every algorithm. That's kind of sort of the mindset of the black hat world. Okay. Okay. Now, yeah, we got some people. Like I said, this one hundred percent raw. So y'all just gonna have to listen because um, you know you you have to lean a little closer to your mic. Yeah, I'm leaning. A little. All right, and. Should I get closer? No, no, you, 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 you good, you good, you good. The thing is, let's see. Uh, like I said, we we're just playing around. So the amazing. All right, let me get this in here. The amazing selling machine, right? Yeah. How was your experience with that? Because I don't know anything about it. I've heard stuff about it, and one of the things I like to do is get people who use it because I've never used it. It's not my it's not my thing. How was your experience with the amazing selling machine? My experience with the amazing selling machine is that me personally I had a good experience, but again it's because I already had a skill set. I think if you came into Amazing Selling Machine, came into that program, so it's a program, they have loads of content, uh, they bring a lot of uh, speakers and, and thought leaders and experts to the table to help people get over the hump, but it's and it's supposed to be for beginners, you know, to advance people. But realistically, my thing is, if you come in, if you just come in fresh off the street, you've never done anything on the internet, and then you go through the amazing selling machine process, I don't think you're going to be as successful in a short amount of time. It may, you know, maybe it may take a long, it may take a longer time. But after paying like eight thousand dollars for that course, because that's what it was at the time. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. I, I have like, hold on. Let me let me get this straight. You paid eight thousand dollars for that course. Wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Because this this is good. This this is good. You paid eight thousand dollars for the course. Right. And uh, to be fair, because you know you had ramp up time and stuff. Yeah. 
how much did you make your first six months? That, I think that should be fair because, you know, you, you can't say your first month because you, yeah. you've got to do stuff. But uh, how much the first six months? Maybe $1,500 if I'm lucky. And that's probably, realistically, that's probably not even counting Amazon fees. So realistically, maybe you're talking like $900. How much do you make the first year? Uh, oh, the first year? Well, since I didn't get, well, the next year, I'll have to count next year because I didn't get started until like October. So, so thankfully, I got started at that time because of the holidays. So I had like a lot of false positives. So the following year, I think I did maybe like, Maybe like fifty, sixty thousand dollars, something like that. Okay, okay. Now, this is why I'm saying this right here because I know how much money he makes it. Because this is one of the things that I'm, I'm like, I'm actually bringing people on here who actually make real money. And he started, so this is 2013, and then so, so you really didn't start rolling to like what 2014? Yeah, like 2014. Yeah. Okay, so fifty six grand after spending right. eight. You talking about people making real money? I just had this check in my back pocket. You right. got <laughs> wait, wait a minute. You got a check. <laughs> who's the, who's this check? Hair. Oh, that who's that check? Like? <laughs> you got he come up here with checks. This is all right. This is all right. Glenn, oh, no, it's just Glenn is a real cat, so I got to make sure I come up here. You know, you got, that, that is funny. Okay. <laughs> So <laughs> this is <laughs> this is hilarious. Wow. All right. So eight thousand dollars. So someone else could spend eight grand and really not do that well. Exactly. So what I saw from my experience was I asked probably about thirty people around October of the following year, how are you doing in your business and are you getting ready for the holidays? And the answers was continuously, no, I'm not ready. I haven't done anything with this content. Uh, it was too overwhelming and yada, yada, yada. So you, so that was like at least 30 people that had spent eight grand and they hadn't done anything. Whoa, whoa, what, what, wait, 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 wait. So people are spending eight grand and not doing anything with the information. Zero. I think I need to raise my. I'm just playing. I'm just messing with Ross. I'm just messing with Ross. I'm just right. All right. So when when did this thing start to really click for you? I mean, because you already said you had experience. This wasn't your first rodeo. Yep. You were in like one of my hustlers kung fu groups. That's it. Yeah. When was that? 2012, yeah. 11. Yeah, 2012, I think. And 2012, yeah. So you got started in like 2014. When did you, like, how much did you make 2015? Because I'll say that would be your first real year. Yeah, so that year, I think I pushed, like, maybe, like, 200, I mean, not 200, it was, like, maybe, like, 105 or $115,000, something like that. Okay, all right. And that was through Amazon? That was or? through Amazon. That was 100% through Amazon. Now, how much of that was profit? How much of that was profit? Uh, minus 30%, so whatever that would be. So what was that, maybe, like, 70 grand, something like that? Now so you had the cost of goods. You had the cost of goods. Or... Yeah. So, was, yeah. So minus cost. Let's say. Let's just say I made half of that would be profit, because my cost of goods at the time. My cost of goods is like sixty-seven cents, and then it's selling for like fifteen dollars. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I got a lot of margin in there. So 2016. Let, let Let's just Let's just roll on. So 2016. Yeah. How much did you make? 2016, um, 2016, I think 2016, it was like another hundred and, uh, I think maybe it was like a hundred and, let's say maybe like another 115,000. At this point in time, 2016, now I'm off of Amazon and transitioning to Shopify. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you are, see, cause like I said, um, I'm going to just say this. I've, I've seen him on Facebook with Facebook friends, you know, and I've been seeing him making moves. I did not know that you were off of Amazon. Yeah. Oh, this is very, very good. This yeah. is this is real interesting. <laughs> All right. Why did you decide to leave Amazon? The reason why the reason why I left Amazon is because I'm I'm pushing um, I'm pushing I'm in the, I'm in the hair law I'm in the hair law space. So Amazon had flagged my product as being a hazmat 
being really? hazardous product. Okay. So as I'm as I'm scaling, you know, as I'm scaling on Amazon, I'm starting to hit like twenty thousand dollars a month, and I'm getting ready to move up. And then the next day, I wake up in the morning, and I have zero sales. And typically, by that time, I would already had. I don't know, $1,000 or something like that worth of sales. Right. And then I'm just at zero. And then I have this red icon. I click on the icon and they're like, oh, we flagged your we flagged your um, product as, as hazardous. I checked the group, the ASM group, and contact some of the other people that's selling. And they just sent out this algorithm that had hit like a lot of products and just, cl- and just hit a lot of products and uh, said that we were hazardous. So that took about three months. That took about, not three, maybe it took about two and a half months to work out. So two and a half months, no cash, no cash coming in, still paying bills and everything. I was still, thankfully, I was still good because I had savings. And it was at that point in time that I'm driving down the street and I'm hearing Glendon uh, in the back of my mind say, uh, what were you saying? You were saying, he was saying something to the effect of, uh, you can make more money on your own platform than you can on Amazon. And because I was using SEO tricks and all type of stuff like that, I was ranked. I wasn't even spending money on advertising. I just kind of thought Glenn was out of his mind. And he was showing different people that had lost money on Amazon and the whole nine. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, that's them. But, you know, look at me. I'm over here still doing good. And then now something that's basically really out of my control then hit me. And there was nothing that I could do to, to get this money back. And then once I did recover from that, I still would have had to put more money into rescaling the product and relaunching the product. To regain everything that I uh, to regain everything that I had lost, so it was that point that I sat down and started looking at the numbers again, which Glendon had taught me how to do. He had taught me to look at my numbers, and we're going to get into that with the whole water plant thing. But Glendon told me how to look at my numbers, and when I looked at the numbers, I said, "Okay, well, I'm already giving Amazon thirty percent. If I'm doing a hundred, if I'm doing a hundred thousand, I'm giving them thirty thousand dollars. What am I getting back from that? And at any point in time, they can just they can just take everything away from me. Plus, I'm not getting any customer data. I'm not getting anything." So at that point, I was like, these aren't my customers. These are Amazon customers. So at that point in time, I sat down and said, okay, if I spent $30,000 on Facebook a month, how much money would I make? What would my profits be? And when I looked at those numbers, that's when I was like, okay, let me go ahead and make this switch. All right. Uh, I'm just going to I'm gonna just come in here and say something. I did not know that he was not on Amazon. I'm serious. I, I did not know because you know I assume I still have the I still have the profiles and everything. Like of today, if I wanted to ship some stuff in, I'll be I would be up and running. But when I just look at the amount of money I'm spending on advertising now, and when those customers go to Amazon versus coming to my store to buy, I'm technically losing money. Now maybe once I get up to a certain amount of ad spend, which is what I'm thinking, once my ad spend grows to a certain level, then I will just get on Amazon because there's customers that are only going to buy on Amazon, so I should be on that platform at that time. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Now it, this is this is the point I want to say because I just consult right now. I, I I do a lot of consulting and I've had this is wild. Like one, I don't know, she might be in the chat room. Amazon pretty much screwed her, some totally different. Mm. Then another client, oh my God, like yesterday, kind of something similar to what you had going down. Yeah. And I think you can make like a hundred great, you know, up to maybe a hundred K a year with no issues on Amazon. But when you start really scaling, they, I mean, cause the thing is, I'm just still bugging on the uh, the amazing selling machine because that's two hundred and forty thousand dollars that ninety percent of the people did nothing with. That that is mine. That's staggering. That's staggering. But accountability. People good need, lord. People need accountability. People need people need accountability, and I think that was the biggest thing. Is that yeah, you spent that money, and the group is supposed to be somewhat, you know, holding you accountable. But if you really don't link up with somebody, and just like in the military, you know, where you have the buddy system and everything right. else, if you really don't have somebody that's that's literally calling your phone saying, "Hey, let's watch video one together. Hey, let's implement what we learned from video one, and then let's go through that whole process." People, I think, a lot of times fail in the whole, you know, hustling and and doing their own thing because of lack of accountability and the people that's around them don't understand the process and they're basically just telling them a lot of negative stuff. And that's why I like the content that we get from Glennon. I hate to keep just referring, you know, deferring to Glennon, but you know, Glennon is basically trying to help you get your mind right because this is tough. You know, this this you know, you really have to be built, you know, a certain way mentally 
to go through some of the grind that it takes to get things off of the ground. And people don't, you know, people that are worker bees, they don't really understand why you're putting in, you know, 50, you know, 80 hours a week. And, you know, you may only make like $15 and you're like super excited that you made $15 and they're, you know, walking away with a decent paycheck from their job. And it's because you know that you can scale that 15 to 100 grand. Okay. All right. So let's talk about your transition. Okay. How did you transition off of um, Amazon to, no, you're using Shopify. Because like I said, yeah. I, I, I'm like, I'm, I'm still kind of like bugging because you were, Last I, I knew you were you were selling hair and stuff yeah. on Amazon. Yeah. I did not know that you had transitioned. So 2017, you've been on your own platform the whole time, or uh, yeah, yeah, 2000, yeah, 2017, but 100% me. So, all right, and you're spending how much in that spend? I'm spending uh, $1,500 a day. 45k a month. 45k a month on Facebook ads. And well, what's all right. I'll, how much do you make per month on that? Yeah. So I'm doing a hundred thousand dollars a month now with okay. that. Hundred about a hundred and fifteen. It fluctuates. Yeah. Okay. So you went from. Th this is really good. And you, now I'm about to now I'm about to hit. The, so this year is going to be gross. This year it'd be gross a million dollars. Okay. Where I wasn't doing that on Amazon. So you you left Amazon, but you always been doing the Facebook ads because I remember you were like yeah. doing some kind of herbal products something that's what that that's what i was selling on amazon it's that it's a herbal hair loss product it's a herbal hair loss formula and oh, the okay hair, the hair extensions i was selling through the hair salon so that's so now i was trying to scale that so i built another shopify store and now i'm working on something to start scaling that okay okay yeah. this this is wild so really facebook ads and shopify have been better for you than amazon yes well, why do you think that's like the case? I mean, because, you know, you, you hear this stuff like Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. Why do you think it's like, I mean, seriously, why do you think that works better for you? Uh, personally, you become Amazon. So. Whoa, whoa say, say, say that again. <laughs> say that again. Say that again. You become Amazon. That's why it works better. So all the tricks, um, there's no limitations. All the limitations that Amazon place on place upon you, you know, whether it's you know, upselling the customers, whether it's emailing the customers, you can actually create a full out business on your own platform. Amazon doesn't want you to create a full out business. And what I mean by full out is actually creating a back end where now you can start creating, doing the email marketing and everything else. So you're paying to get this customer in, but at that point in time, Amazon is like limiting the amount of emails that you can send customers now. Before, you could create a whole back end off of customers that you generated and brought in Amazon. They even shutting that down now. I think they only want you to send like three automated emails to customers oh my goodness you know this is something funny right here um typically if you know my stuff doesn't work like really quick right. but if people take it in around year two three and it all clicks up they make one more. this is funny this is funny because he was uh in the hustle kung fu group yep um he got in like way cheap all right enough of me Cause I'm just sitting here like this. This is too funny. I still think it's a good place for people to start because uh, there is a lot of there is a lot of traffic on Amazon. So I do think that it's a great starting platform. And then once you get you know once you get set up on the platform and you know and you're getting some cash flow and everything, as Glenn and say, start to invest in your own stuff because a lot of because you now become Amazon and. People do sell Amazon businesses, like they'll build up, you know, they'll build up these listings and everything, and they'll build the business up and they'll turn around and sell it. But a lot goes into that, and it also it's, it's about, you know, what products you pick. I mean, there's a whole strategy behind it, and that's the reason why business models are built around Amazon, and it's, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. So it is a platform to master, and I know people that are creating tools around it that's going to help people rank, rank listings and so on and so forth and try to get that free traffic. But as Glendon says, you should definitely build your own platform because at some point in time, and it is going to come, the hammer is going to come, whether it's a, whether it's a, um, you know, whether you did something that was against terms, terms of service where it was, it was okay. And then now this year it's not okay. Or, you know, or whether or not you just get hit with a, a hazmat algorithm, like all of us got hit with. So if you only, if, if you have one product that's leading, and you don't have other products that are in that funnel or other products that are doing just as well. If that one product gets hit, you know, then you're just you're just out of it. 
that is that that that's crazy. All right. So let's talk about you it's just you. You start your own business. Yep. What's the first thing that you did to start your e commerce business? What what's the first thing? Well, of course set up the website. Okay, website. Yeah. So set the so set the website up. Um and I pro and you know, research. So research is key. So obviously Realistically, I'm building a business based off of needs that people have told me that they have. So I already know that I can fulfill these people's needs because I know that that's not in the marketplace. So the first thing is research. And then from there, building a website. And then from there, graphics, image, and also sales copy. Okay. Yep. Then after you get that going, what, what, what's next? Then the next thing is breaking, breaking out the numbers. You know, the, uh, the market tells me how much I can sell that product for. And then from there, it's all about, can I buy that product at a low enough price? And then it's also factoring in, what is the cost going to be to advertise said product? And then once I sit down and work out all those numbers, then I know, then I have, then I have the formula to know that I'm golden. And again, that's where Hustlers Kung Fu came into play. <laughs> because, <laughs> because I was out here, I was out here, uh, I don't know if we're going to, I'm just going to keep it with the e-commerce thing. And I guess at some point we'll get into the whole Africa thing. But when at the, at the Glendon set down like uh and this is on uh this is on um uh zero to twenty five hundred in thirty days in that program in that program in one of the videos I think it's maybe like video I think it's maybe like day three he's like okay now let's sit down and let's work out your numbers and these numbers are important and so on and so forth so Glendon starts breaking down understand that you need to at least have a thirty percent margin in whatever it is that you're selling. So when you know these numbers, so when you sit down and you look at, you know, something that's selling, you know, you're buying it at $10 and you can sell it for 30, you know, or 40 and, uh, and it's going to cost you, you know, the $10 to sell it, you know, then you may have that margin in there. So I had never seen these numbers before. So I'm just thinking, you know, you know, buy low, sell high. And, and that's kind of sort of it. So Glendon, you know, breaks down these numbers. So when I got these numbers broken down and I put them to this Excel spreadsheet and I started looking at the stuff that I was selling and the other businesses that I was operating in, I was in the red in all of those businesses. So yeah, I was bringing in, let's say I'm bringing in like $50,000 a month in one business, but I had to put in another $2,500 and kept trying to figure out why I had to put this money in. And it's because the business was operating in the red. I was overpaying employees and I was overspending on everything else. And when I did that, it was like, it was like that sent a shockwave through all of my businesses. And I had to start shutting stuff down just because of these numbers. So now when I launched my e-commerce business, I built margin into the product out the gate. So I started making certain offerings based off of the margins. The margins really determined how I was even how how I served the product up to the market. And that's thanks to Glennon. All right. Okay. All right. So <laughs> let's this this is wow. Now I'm gonna go over here to the chat room because <laughs> people's minds are blown. They don't even know how to ask questions. <laughs> Because, no, they're just used to seeing me up here. Let's right. see. Uh, what's up, Diana? What's up, Char? What's up, Monica? Leonard? Roz? Let's see what's going on here. What's up, Lamote? Archangel? HK? I did not know it was that much. Mm -hmm. Roz, please don't give Glenn any ideas of raising prices on courses. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, too late. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, that's right. Uh, 50K on 8K, that's 600% of the year. Erica Williams, I could believe it. Now, Amina, if I had 8K, I'd be doing that real estate. Mm. Uh, let's see. How did you shift from Amazon to your e-commerce store? We covered that. Uh, let's see. Making this easy. I've been on this ground, so that's all right. And I'll, and I'll make one more, one more comment to that, about the shift from Amazon uh, to Shopify. What, for me, personally... Amazon, because I came from the SEO world, Amazon was an SEO play for me. So my SEO skill set, keyword research, and that whole nine was, was a big thing. And later on, later on, I started getting into conversion rate numbers and all mm -hmm. this type of stuff like that. And that's when I brought on uh, a copywriter. And this dude came in, rewrote the copy for the website, and my sales quadrupled overnight. And I was like, whoa. I was like, okay, I had heard about this whole copyright thing, but I didn't know it was that intense. So when I made the transition from from Amazon to Shopify, I just copy paste, you know, and I just brought the copy over and then I was like, okay, well, you know, here's the same copy, you know, let's, it should work. And it wasn't working. And I was like, whoa, I was like, okay, I got to dig more into this whole advertising piece. 
And that was the big that was the big thing where I had to start studying advertising. And that, once I understood that and I created, you know, I created some advertising pieces, that's what caused the launch. All right. Hold up. Hold up. So when did you make the um, the big change with the copywriter? Because, you know, that does make a big difference. Like, so what, what point did you uh, bring the copywriter? Because uh, didn't I see a post? Um, is that recent or was that last year? Which post? Uh, on the copywriter. When did you bring the copywriter in? I brought the copywriter in in 2015. So okay. I brought him in in 2015, yeah. All right. So, all right. I was just checking. Yeah. So you got a copywriter, yep. you, you've, you've got your stuff rolling, mm -hmm. and you're pretty much set on this. It's just a matter of scaling. Yeah, now, yeah, now it's just scaling. And you've been uh, on your own website since what, 2000? Since, uh, since probably like, let's say, uh, no, it was, actually, it was actually May, May of 2000, like May, May of 2016. All right, so you yeah. had a full year on your own website. Yeah. Whereas 2015, th 14, 13. and 13, you were on Amazon and yep. you did not make this kind of money. No. That's, that's yeah. pretty interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Now, one thing that Ty is doing is paying people like crazy. Like you got another copywriter, yep. you know, uh, Tommy. Yep. Tommy's a friend of mine. I'll actually be hanging out with him in a few weeks. I'll be with you. Oh, you gonna come? Yeah, oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be wild. It's yeah, going to be wild. Yeah, the, how, now, let's talk about the water plant because yeah. what made you, now, if you didn't know, hold on, let me let me make sure so y'all can see him. This is an African right here. You know, he's an African. <laughs> and oh, I'm African-American turned African. African. <laughs> <laughs> when, yeah. when he was... Someone was asking me, like, you know, about going to Africa, doing all these business in Africa. And I was like, I'm not going. Yeah. I said, like, let me ask an African. So I went and hit up Ty. And I was like, hey, you know, because uh, many people have these false notions about Africa. I have not been to Africa, but I am an adult. And I know that if you go into a land where you do not know the lay of the land, that people will take advantage of you. So let's, uh, let's just uh, topically, like, if you don't, would you not be an African, move to Africa, if you had no clue, or no, better yet, what have you seen happen to folks who go over there and try to get all this African money, and then they don't know anything about the culture, they don't know anything about the language, what usually happens to those folks? They walk away butt naked with their passport, crying. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it, no, okay, because, <laughs> all right, we get all these hotel people on here, like, go back to Ooh. Africa, uh, oh, I got called weak for not wanting to move to Africa. Mm. The thing is, I'm making bread here. Why am I going to leave this to go over there and not make any bread or yeah. have to learn how to make bread? That, yeah. that makes no sense. Yeah. A friend of mine said that, he said, if you're going to muck around, you should muck around at the top. And what I see in the, in the Hotep community, <clears throat> and, I, and I love the Hotep knowledge. You know what I'm saying? I love the, the Hotep knowledge. I grew, I grew up around people that were... Um, you know, five percenters and, you know, Nation of Islam and, and so on and so on and so forth. But when you actually sit down and have real conversations with these guys, <clears throat> there's a reason why Chicago still looks like it does and the Nation of Islam headquarters is right there. And it's because when you actually stand out there with the brother that's selling those bean pies and passing out those um, uh, final calls, you'll understand that that is a community that you have to basically, quote unquote, buy into. And then once you buy into that community, then they're trying to help you. But they're but they're in the community selling bean pies and giving out final calls. But they're not they're not taking that knowledge and then truly trying to help the community from a political standpoint, educating people on local politics and the whole nine. So so that's even the thing within itself. So I think that that's probably why they you know you know probably use that to somewhat isolate themselves. But I know that they're also trying to use it because they're trying to get people uh, to think a certain way. You know, but at the end of the day, they haven't really had an effect on that community. So transitioning on with the whole hotel thing a lot of these brothers that i see they didn't went they didn't they didn't went and you know maybe they watched a couple of youtube videos and maybe they went to jail or maybe they was just around people that was in the community and they educated themselves about going back to africa and typically they go back to you know different places in egypt or maybe they go you know they go wherever they go wherever they go different places in south america but business is business and that you can go back to africa and find out that africans don't know anything about themselves 
there's two words that we hear. One word is called the akata, which is a word that's used in West Africa to describe African Americans. And then if you're on the East Coast, you may just straight up hear wazungu, which basically just means the white man. And you can be, you know, say you can be as black as me and be called a wazungu. I was never called that, but you can be called that. And it's just because of your mindset. And the akata is with uh, is with most people on the West Coast. I won't just say Nigerians, but it's a term that they use to describe African Americans because <clears throat> typically they're talking African Americans that don't want to associate with Africa or don't even understand that that's where their lineage comes from. Period. So that's kind of sort of that back and forth that you have. So so that's so that's one thing. So now let's so now let's get past all that. Let's just get to straight doing business in the country. To do business <laughs> to do business. In Africa, uh, you're gonna have to learn the culture. Like you're gonna have to, you know. So you had, you know, you just like just like over here in America, you had, you know, uh, uh, you had slavery and everything else that took place that shifted our mindsets and everything else. And in Africa, you're not now. You have to look at yourself coming over there as an African American as if you're from a different tribe. Is one how you have to look at yourself. So there's tribalism there in Africa already. Certain tribes really don't do business with each other. So you just can't really walk in off the street unless you're being introduced. I have like uh, three African names. I have a name from Nigeria. I have a name from Uganda, and I also have a name uh, from Kenya. So one is from the um, one is from the uh, Igbo tribe in uh, in Nigeria, and then the other one in Kenya. Is from the uh, the other one in Kenya is from the Kikuyu tribe, and they're and these tribes are similar. These tribes are typically like Jewish people, so they're all about business and everything. You can't come to the table. Let's say my name. Let's say my name was. Uh, uh, give me a name. Let's say my name was uh, Ayango. Ayango is a Lua name, and and Lua is basically the same tribe that Obama's from. But Lua's are more so the, the the mechanics and this is that and third. These are more mechanical people. But the dominating tribe in Kenya is the Kikuyu tribe. So typically, when you're trying to do business, especially, and I don't just want to say at a high level, but typically when you're trying to do business in in Kenya, the people that are controlling the distribution, the first tier people is going to be the Indians, straight up from India, and uh, so they control about anywhere between fifty to seventy percent of the industrial market there. So when I was building, when I built the water plant, I started buying bottles and I started buying parts for the machine. I was always buying it from an Indian distributor, not even from, not even from a Kenyan. So, and then even if I did go to like uh, Davis and, and Sheffields, even if I did go to them, the person that was running it was, was typically an Indian guy. And then the guy I was dealing with was a Kenyan guy. So we have to understand that first. So you, first you have to understand, like Glenn just said, first you have to understand the lay of the land and then you have to understand the corruption. And, how, and the part that corruption plays. So for me, I bought, I actually purchased the water plant, the actual reverse osmosis system or the water purification system. I purchased that from Dubai. Then the um, one of the highest, um, uh, one of the highest uh, um, uh, stress or or um, the hardest thing to do, one of the biggest risks was getting it from the the port in Dubai into the port of Mombasa in Kenya. That was the biggest thing, and it was making sure that you had a broker. That could handle that and making sure that you understood how much corruption was at the port and how many people you would have to pay off prior to you getting your stuff. So again, this is all money. This don't have anything to do with. They don't care about you. You know, knowing. You know. Uh, you know, knowing what my yacht stands for and all type of stuff like that. They don't care about any of that thing. Only thing they care about is them dollars, and they don't care about future profits. All they care about is the money that they're going to make today. If you gave them, if you gave them. And this is this isn't just in Kenya because I've been to um, I've been to uh, uh, Ethiopia as well. I've been to Ethiopia and heard from a millionaire in Ethiopia. I was sitting at a table with a millionaire and a billionaire, and both of them was complaining. And these are these are these are Ethiopians. So this is a Ethiopian billionaire and an Ethiopian millionaire, and they're complaining about this same mindset. And this is it. If I give a Kenyan or if I give an Ethiopian a hundred dollars today and i tell you hold on to this hundred dollars i'm gonna come back and take this hundred dollars from you on friday and give you a thousand dollars just make sure this hundred dollars is there to uh, just make sure this hundred dollars is there on friday every time you show up on friday there's going to be an excuse as to why that hundred dollars is not there so understand so so you have to again you have to start to you have to get in these countries sift away people and find people that maybe was educated in the west 
and you know it was educated in the west and they kind of sort of understand that mindset but they're not locked into that corrupt mindset that i got to get paid the day mindset and you have to be ready to not only pay for whatever the regular rate is but also pay a little extra because people are going to be sitting around and they're going to be expecting to be taken out to dinner um, you know, they're going to be expecting for you to bring stuff in from the States for them, you know, expecting you to bring, you know, bring whatever in, you know, things for their kids, video games, weed for their wife, you know, whatever it may be. But they're going to be expecting these little gifts here and there, and they're going to be expecting some extra money on the side. And, and you need to you need to bring these things up. It can't be them because they're looking at you as if you don't understand how things are working there. So they will never suggest they're very conservative. So they're never going to suggest that you give me a couple extra dollars. It's always going to be assumed that you know. <laughs> Man, I'm just sitting here listening. You know what that sounds like? What that sounds like? like America, you know, um, about 70 years ago. Oh, yeah, there it is. It's what it, is. it sounds like America like 70 years ago because yeah. the same graph, the same stuff. That is wild. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about, a bum, you know, I'm talking about you walk, I'm talking about you going to the 15th store, you know, uh, the 15th level of a building sitting down talking to, you know, talking to somebody in, you know, the the import export office and this guy sitting behind the desk with a suit and has his fancy title in the whole nine. That's the guy that wants to be taken out to dinner later on that night. That's the guy that wants you to, you know, saying with a smile on your face, slide him an extra check so that he can make sure all your stuff, you know, passes through without any issue. That's the guy I'm talking about. Good Lord. Yeah. That's that's just, that's deep. That's yeah. deep. Yeah. What made you decide to build a water fur, fur, uh, purification plant there? Law of attraction. So I was basically meditating and just said, okay, I just want to do something. And I was like, I just want to make money. That was, that was, you know, that was it. I was like, I want to make money. And I was just looking for, just looking for an opportunity. And that was one of the opportunities that presented itself while I was working for Halliburton at the time. So at the time I was working for Halliburton, security. Um, at the, at before that, I was doing petroleum engineering for Halliburton. So I was actually testing all their petroleum products. And then I transferred over to security. And I was meditating every day and uh, looking for something. And then I had got sent to this obscure base. And I was out there talking to guys and I was asking the same thing with all the money that we're making over here. And at the time, it was like $8,500 a month is what we're making. And I was like, with all the money we're bringing over here month to month, what are you doing with that money? And a lot of guys were best, was just basically buying homes, cars, and the whole nine. And working in security, I had literally fired somebody or wrote up a report that was going to get somebody fired and met this lady as she was getting off the plane and was telling her that you just lost your job. And typically what happened was people would go away for, you know, for let's say two weeks and spend all this money because they knew when they got back, you know, they was going to, they was going to be making this kind of money. Right, so right. this lady had just bought a home and came back and found out that she was fired. So by me witnessing that, I started training my mind to start thinking I have to have something outside of this job because this is like, you know, drug money or this is like some illegal money that I'm making. And at some point in time, it will go away and this company will fire you, you know, for anything. So I just didn't want to give somebody that type of power, which is kind of sort of the same thing that happened with Amazon. So, so I want to give somebody that type of power to, be, to determine, you know, whether or not I'm going to eat tomorrow. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of people look at me when I say no Amazon, no eBay. They they go yeah. crazy. Yeah. But the thing is, no, I, I've been through it. Yeah. I've been through it. And you wake up, and your listings are gone. <laughs> you, you're like, and there's nothing you can do. At all. And you're just <clears throat> so helpless. Right. And I got a client who's transitioned, who's really trying to leave Amazon. Mm -hmm. And at, at some point, there's like self-doubts and stuff because... Right. You said it. When you do Amazon, you become Amazon. That's it. Which means you don't learn how to market correctly. Nope. You don't learn how to run an email campaign correctly. Nope. You don't learn how to sell. It's just pick an item yep. that's, you know, this is Amazon. It's like this fast slipstream just going by and you drop something in and it slips. And long as that continues, you're good. That's right. But it's not going to continue. Right. <laughs> I'm going to tell right. you. That's right. That that is wow. Yeah. How much have you put into this water plant? I put uh, one hundred and seventy four thousand dollars into the water plant as cash, no loans, no nothing. So right. when I left when I left um, Halliburton, I started working for Blackwater Security Group, and I started maintaining their logistics and also uh, doing import and export 
for um, for Blackwater. That's how I learned. That's how I learned how to um, deal with people at the port, deal with airway bills and the whole mm -hmm. nine. So I gained that skill set there, and uh, then I transferred over and started working with the security details. And um, so I was actually did like security work for um, Obama when he came. That was at the tail end of his campaign. Um, uh, who was the other guy? Kerry when he was in office, and also when. Um, uh, what is her name? Clinton, Hillary Clinton, when she was in office as well. So I had a chance to protect them. But so at that point in time, then I then I transitioned, started making like sixteen thousand five hundred dollars a month. So that's how much money I was making with them, and I was living paycheck to paycheck because I was spending seven grand to get you know uh, you know ten six thousand dollars for the um, six thousand dollars for the land, then another ten thousand dollars to get the well drilled, and the well is actually drilled. The well is like seven hundred and seventy feet deep or two hundred and twenty meters deep. So I'm actually tapped into the aquifer, like the Grajan aquifer there right. in Kenya. So I'm gonna never run out of water um, for, for, the, for that water plant, and it's the only well in that area that's actually drilled that deep. So, um, so, so that was that. So, um, so all the all of this money that kept going into the plant, and then to turn around and get all the way to the point of dis, distrib, um, distribution, where now I'm actually building out a uh, building out these set uh, these distribution cells, and I'm starting to sell water. I had every line item, so I had the twenty, th the twenty liter jug, the ten liter jug, the five liter jug, all the way down to the one ounce. And then I'm on the internet, listen to this guy, Glennon Cameron, and uh, and I buy this course, zero to twenty five hundred. And I'm already making, I'm already making already over twenty five hundred dollars. But I just trusted the knowledge that he was given, so I was like, well, let me just skim over and just see what happens. And when he broke down those numbers, I immediately called the accountant who was actually running this. And when I sent the accountant the spreadsheet and broke down the number, and I I just did I just did like one end item that we had, one of the products that we had was like the twenty the twenty gallon jug. We was making profit on that, but then when I when we went through the rest of those, um, when we got all the way to the one ounce, we could really only carry. Let's say we had ten, we could only really carry let's say four of those and actually make that thirty percent profit that Glennon told me that I needed. And from that point on, it just went from there. So I just start I just looked at I just started looking at business in a whole in a whole different um, whole different level. So I immediately told him to shut shut this down, not even order this stuff anymore. And we had we had distributors, and I told him we had to fire all those distributors, and they had to become employees because the numbers just didn't add up. That's deep. So <laughs> that, that I'm like seriously, my mind is blown. How much money do you make from the water plant now? Zero. Oh damn. Yeah. Zero. And what what's your plan for the water plant? You know, so my plan my plan for the water plant is right now right now I'm in court. So the guy that I went into partnership with, the Kenyan guy that I went into partnership oh, was, Lord. yeah, was a Lua guy. And this guy was actually working for Halliburton at the time. So I thought everything was cool. I'm like, he's working overseas with me, yada, yada, yada. And long story short, the example that I gave you about the, about the Kikuyu versus the, versus the Lua, the distributors that we were going to were, were, uh, were Kikuyu distributors because these are the guys that, these guys are basically running the country. The president of Kenya is Kikuyu. So long story short, when we would approach them with the water, they would read the name on the back of it, read the name of the company, and they would be like, okay, we don't understand what the whole spear is. Okay, that's, that translates to Makuki in Swahili, but this Ayango, we know this is Lua. So they was like, nah, we don't want to do business with the company. Not asking about what the quality of water is, not asking about where the water comes from, not asking to tour the water plant, none of that. Just out the gate because it was associated with him because associated with that tribe and that tribal history, you know, the issues that they've had between each other, they was like, nah, because they had a big war and they was actually trying to kill all of them off. So they was like, you know, we're never going to forget that. So they're like, we're not, we're not rolling with them like that. So this isn't, this isn't every Lua Kikuyu person, you know, if you're taking it by a case by case basis, but on the largest scale, people, people fear each other on a larger scale. Like you don't know if like, you know, somebody's going to come through the crib and start killing your kids or whatever on a larger scale when those types of tensions heat up. And they just had the elections there last month. So I was actually gonna go in September, but they had the elections there. And you're talking about corporations and different nonprofits were packing up and leaving because they were scared that, you know, that who the president was running up against, they were gonna spark up those flames, those tribal flames that already, you know, that already exist there. And then they was gonna have this war and back and forth. People didn't wanna be caught in the middle of it. 
So my so the partner that I had basically I am on never the- <laughs> going to Africa. I am not going to Africa, man. There's nothing wrong with going to Africa. No, I'm just playing. No, yeah. I'm not going there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like I think Kenya is probably one of the better places to go to. South Africa, South Africa is cool. Again, if you're just going to be going and getting it, you know, I think Kenya is probably one of the cooler countries because this probably would have been a different situation had I been in Nigeria. You know, in Nigeria, I probably would have straight up had to get somebody killed. And that, and that, so that's one thing we need to understand. This is a high level of business. It's like you're sitting at the table with people and they're asking you, like, why are you even going through the court system? Why don't you just have this dude killed? Because to get this dude killed is like $80. You see what I'm saying? So it's a whole different, you know, this ain't, you know, we talk, talk about the whole tips and all that. I just, I just laugh because they really don't know what it's like and even some of the leading hotel people that I've talked to because uh, I've sit down, I've sat down with these people and met these people in person the people that had bought hotels in West Africa these people didn't got crapped on you know they didn't came back and found out all of the um, you know they shipped a, they shipped a container over there with furniture in it and probably spent like 30k on that container and then and then they get there and then they, now the guys at the port because they didn't have these relationships saying we don't know where that container's at we don't know wow. where that, we don't know where that thirty thousand dollars worth of furniture is at, so they're sitting there with they're sitting there with an empty hotel and they're sitting up there looking crazy. Now this right here is you know business to business. Yeah. You go over there, you don't know that. Like I didn't know any of this stuff. I knew that you know I figure I'm smarter than the average bear. I'm not going to go to right. Nigeria, or Kenya because I don't know the country. Right. And I dated a girl from Cameroon. Okay. And this girl, that's West Africa. She did not have a pair of shoes. She know she got her first pair of shoes when she was twelve. Mm-hmm. And you know, I remember that because she was she immigrated to France. She became an attorney. Okay. And I was just like, I was like, wait a minute, you didn't have your first pair, your first pair of shoes when you were twelve. Right. And I was just sitting there like, this is a whole different country. Right. And now what you telling me? Because my my mind is just right. blown because. Yeah, all these folks who come here and they're like, let's go to Africa, let's go there. And what you're saying is they have no clue to what's really going on in Africa. At all. And At all. the mindset, your mind isn't even, your mind isn't even, you're not, you're not mentally ready to do business in Africa. That, that, that is a mental process within itself. You have to understand that certain, you have to understand that a man can be married to a woman in Africa and not even tell this woman what he's doing with his business. Or he don't he does not do this tribe. They do not do business with their wives. So you can be you can be introduced through this man through his wife, and this dude may never do business with you because he's not crossing that, you know, doing business with you and my wife's involved. He does he just doesn't roll like that. So there's all these little nuances, you know, that you need to be aware of. And we ain't even gotten to the supernatural stuff because that stuff is real. <laughs> you know, there's a, so there's these there's these levels. But one one lower level thing I want to talk about is just our innate ability to trust as Americans. Mm-hmm. If I shake your hand and you tell me that you're gonna do something, I know that there may be something that may happen, but it's, some, it's gonna be something reasonable. You know, over there, people don't even trust their own fathers. It's like, you know, what? it may have to be their mother. I mean, so you're talking about now, we're talking about, you know, same tribe, same everything. And it's like, I can't even really trust my cousin to take care of this business. You know, so, I mean, like, we talking about like, there's a, there's a story of a guy that has a, has a chicken farm. He is Kenyan from Kenya. You know, maybe he went to school in the U.S. a little bit, but he's an actual news reporter and everything. So they was doing a story on him. And long story short, he would be going away to do news, to going away to do news broadcasts, and then come back and be checking on the chicken farm. And the people that was working on the farm were killing the chickens, or saying the chickens had died or got sick or whatever, but they was just stealing from them. So he had to literally quit doing a news program and just be there day in and day out to watch that chicken farm so that that chicken farm could be successful. And this is a Kenyan in Kenya from the tribe and the whole nine. So you have all these, so you have all these different nuances. So our trust factor has to be adjusted. And I think doing business in Africa makes you an even better businessman here in the United States. Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Here in the United States, you will, and that's probably why you see a lot of Africans that come here specifically, you know, Nigerians is who we probably see the most. I even saw two Nigerians downstairs when I came up here. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I saw the two brothers downstairs. So, and it's it's because of that grit, it's because of that grind, it's because of that, uh, you know, it's because of that, you know, that hustle mentality that Glenn has always talks about, it's because of that hustle mentality and they don't trust anything, so they're double checking, triple checking things 
you know, it's like I can't stand to lose a penny. And you understand why, you know, every dime, every nickel, you know, means something to these people. And it's because where they where they came from, they couldn't just sign on the dotted line, shake hands, and then walk off and think everything's be okay. It's like they had to check everything. You say there's going to be 50, 50 pieces in this container, open the container up, let me check these 50 pieces. Okay, boom. We get to the next checkpoint, open it up again, let me check it again. We get to the next checkpoint, on and on and on. And that takes a that takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of time. And typically we just want to fall back and be like, okay, I've done my part. I paid this guy my money. You know, I shook hands with him. I've been on him for six weeks. Everything is cool. From the very first transaction that I did with this guy in Kenya that I had been knowing for two years prior to that, me and him just had been working together with Halliburton. He was the IT manager and I was over operations. So we had been knowing each other for a minute. The very first transaction he burned me on the very first transaction. <laughs> The very first transaction he burned me. The very first transaction was buying land that cost twelve thousand dollars, quote unquote. The land only cost six thousand. So when he got my six thousand, he had already paid for the land. Turned around and sold it for twenty four thousand dollars, and then was still telling me that the land ministry and all this type of stuff like that. And because I'm living paycheck to paycheck, I didn't have the bandwidth to start getting out and doing other things. So once I did, once the once the construction and everything was finished. I had extra money. I flew into the country. I didn't tell him. I went and got. I went and got a. Oh, and I got Airbnb actually. Airbnb in Kenya. Stayed with this. Stayed with this couple that were that were like um, that were like economists. They were like economists. They had like their PhD and they had been trained in like Sweden and all type of stuff like that. And they were Kenyan. They were from the um, uh, I can't uh, the Kumba tribe. Kumba people are very loyal and like, you know, very when Indians come into Kenya, they try to go get Kumbas. They try to go get Kumbas to do all their financial planning and all this type of stuff like that because they really trust them. Wait, 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 wait. So the Indian people already are hipped to who they can trust. Yeah. So. Because they understand these nuances are in India too. These nuance, these nuances aren't just in Africa. It's in, if you're trying to go to India, if you're trying to go down to South America, if you're trying to go to China. You know, if you or well, and if you're trying to go to the uh, if you're trying to go to the the, uh, the Arab countries, especially like in the Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia, which I have been in, you're dealing with these same nuances, these same mindsets. <laughs> that is crazy. All right, so let me check for any uh, hotel dudes. Hold on, let me check. <laughs> I don't see don't, any. Don't show up today. No, they don't show up today. Oh, but right. no, but in the future, I'm going <laughs> yeah. to recommend that they come check this out. Oh yeah. Because that makes sense. Yeah. Because when I was dating, like you know, her name was oddly enough Sarah. Yeah. And she used to tell me this, and I asked her, I was like, "Why? You know, I'm not from Africa. Mm-hmm. Why don't the people in Africa band together and do this thing?" And she said, without even blinking, it's like there's 200 dialects. I was like, what? She's like, where I come from, there's 200 dialects, and everyone speaks a different language. They speak a different language. They don't trust you. They, and it was just like, wow. It was just that simple. The richest asset, the richest asset in Africa is not gold, it's not diamonds, not any of those things. It's trust. <laughs> that, is... That, is, that is the most valuable asset in Africa is trust. How long do you think it's going to be before that turns around like 20 years 30 years 40 years 50 100 or i mean how long have we been how long have african americans been in the united states and we haven't turned it around good point <laughs> good point good point so so this this is this, this this is really good because i get these folks who who come on and like let's all move to africa mm-hmm. and it's a romantic notion because if they really knew what they were getting themselves into they would be like, oh, hell no. Right. You know, like right. visiting Africa, soaking up the culture. That's mm-hmm. one thing. That's one thing. But doing business because the Indians, since, the, you know, it, they're, 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 they know the land better than we do. That's right. They do. And the, the Chinese. Them over there. And the Chinese. The Chi- the, but again, at the, and that's the thing. And that's, and it, and it kind of sort of goes back, it kind of sort of goes back to the whole thing with us where here in the United States, we're not building a whole lot of, infrastructures and institutions and communities so and that's a big thing the indians and the chinese they're bringing a whole community up over there so they are going out and doing business with certain people and so on and so forth and they're building these relationships up and they're building they're building communities now they're building lobbyist groups in kenya to start to lobby so that they can be classed as 
if Kenyan has 43 tribes, they're trying to be classed as the 44th tribe. Because again, they're trying to wiggle themselves into other nuances. It's basically right. just modern day. It's basically just modern day colonialism. You know, just rebranded. Or if you've ever read the book, uh, man, I can't think of the name of the book, and I can't think of the name of the author. But um, man, I wish I could think of that book because that book is phenomenal. But that book shows you how people have slowly implanted themselves into certain countries, built up relationships, and then just brought more of their people into the country, and then just took over. And uh, it's uh, Chancellor Williams is the, na- is the name of the author, Chancellor Williams. And I can't think of the name of the book, but Chancellor Williams is the author. Re- I would tell everybody to read that book because a lot of the, when you ask how did we get here and how did we get into the situation, that book by Chancellor Williams breaks that down, you know, bar none. And when you read that book, you definitely understand how we got to where we are today. And you see it happening over and over again. In Kenya, when I'm talking to Kenyans, from the whole tip knowledge that I've gained about all this history in Africa and everything else, Kenyans do not know who they were prior to colonization of Kenya. So when I'm talking to a Kenyan, I'm asking them, what were you doing before the Wazungu got here, before the white man got here? And they would tell you that they was herding sheep and it was basically just living in huts. Kenyans would tell you this. They don't know anything about the fact of... Tori Wazalu. Uh-huh. They, they don't know, yeah. Any, any of these things of, you know, all of the, you know, all of these ancient sciences and so on and so forth. And they don't they don't know about things now. We'll, we can transition to the whole supernatural thing, and we're still sticking with business. I'm not about to get into no dancing and you know Ouija board and all that type of stuff like that. I'm about to get into some real business stuff and show you how this stuff. If you're doing business in Kenya, or if you're doing business in Africa, esoteric esoteric things or whatever the the voodoo man or whoever you want to call them that has to be a line item in your budget. Has to be. And a guy that I know, a Muslim guy. From um, from India is living in Mombasa. He's making per truck, and he has like five trucks. He's making five thousand dollars a day, importing and exporting um, products from the port of Mombasa, and he's growing his company. Somebody gets mad at him, puts something on one of his, puts something on a couple of his trucks, and now every day the uh, the truck is out of fuel. He just fueled the truck up. All the fuel is gone. Okay, I just go fill the truck back up again. Fill the truck back up. Drive down the street. It's on E. Wait a minute. I got. <laughs> Wait a minute, the destruction of African civiliza- civilization? That's it, the destruction of African civilization. Chancellor Williams, love it. <laughs> your, tri- your, 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 your tribe is tight. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, like, I was like, yeah. okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, destruction of African civilization by Chancellor Williams, love it. So, um, so, this guy, so this guy, he goes to the mechanic, he does this, he does that. Now this one is having electrical issues. Now this one is doing that. He takes it to the mechanic. The mechanic looks at it, and the mechanic asks him, when is the last time you've gotten these trucks blessed off one? And he's like, what? He's like, he's like, I, you know, because he, he's Muslim. So he's like, hey, it's obviously got to be some sort of mechanical issue. And the guy's like, nah, he's like, I'm, you know, this guy's like certified, you know, uh, GM and like Toyota, you know, uh, you know, certified mechanic. And he's like, nope, you need to go have, you know, you need to go have a blessed off one. So he calls another Muslim friend because, again, this is a Muslim community in, uh, in Mombasa, in Kenya. Like I told you, these people are operating in communities and cliques. He's not just calling random strangers. He's calling people within his community. He calls another lady in his community. She calls somebody in Tanzania. They fly this guy in. This guy does his song and dance. All his equipment is back up the next day. He was like, yeah, somebody put something on it. They must have been jealous of you or so on and so forth. So they put something on your equipment. On your equipment. This ain't no tree growing out your neck. This ain't you know, this ain't dreams. This ain't somebody shaking the, shaking the bed and all this type of stuff we see in the horror movies. This is inanimate equipment not working like it's supposed to work because somebody got jealous of you so again that needs to be a line item on your on your uh that needs to be a line item in your business plan you know you need to be budgeting for that when you go up over there and even my own accountant he just had like a like a uh, like a uber taxi that he was putting on the road and it kept getting flat tires and this that and the third happening and the mechanic just simply told him make sure you get this uh make sure you get this car blessed off on before you put it on the road that is insane, <laughs> dude. Levels. That is insane. Levels. Because, all right, I've been to places. I have been to Africa. Mm-hmm. I've been, to, well, I have been to Africa. I've been to the Middle East. Yeah. But I've been to. <laughs> probably one of people's heads. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, it, 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 it's, it's wild. Because yeah. the thing is, when you think of Africa, you forget that Egypt is in Africa. That's right. Liberia is in Africa. That's it. It's just like no, no, we're we're, we're apart from Africa. Even Saudi Arabia. Is Saudi Africa. Arabia is yeah. in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> like us, uh, Raquel. Like I've I've known I dated a Haitian girl. Okay. And Shout she was 
she was she was deep in that voodoo. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons I stopped messing with her because I left in good terms, but what if I had did something crazy? Right. Because she was just like, oh, you, you don't want the relationship? I was like, you know, you're a great person. It's just I'm not ready. Right. I, I broke it off real, real clean <laughs> because <laughs> I come home and she like doing some shit. Yeah. I ain't even going to talk about it, but yeah, it was just yeah. like, all right, right. Okay, okay, you doing that. Yeah. I am not messing with you because right. I don't believe, yeah. but I do believe. You right. Know yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So when you said I don't believe, I was like, yes, you do, because you broke it off with it like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. it's like I, there's certain things you just don't want to accept. Exactly, yeah. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave that over there. I'm going to yeah. leave her there. I'm going to be real cool. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it, it is, it is wild. No it is wild. Yeah. But I, but I but I but I was I was but I will say this: we have to educate ourselves on these things and have this and have a basic understanding because we, we want to do typically, and I'm just talking from an African American standpoint, we want to huddle up, huddle up in the corner with our Bible and scream Jesus, 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 and we have these things that are actually working that people are actually trying to affect us with, and if we have to we have to we're going to have to go a little bit deeper. But one thing that I'm one thing that I'm really just saying is that. You need to be aware so that way when you're in the room, you can look around the room and be like, I think, you know, oh, they got this, they got that. You need to at least be conscious enough to be able to look around the room and see that something's not right. And that way you can now slowly start to go ahead and remove yourself from that situation. Just like when you're, you know, just like when you're on the street and you're parked at a light and you just, you start to look at the rearview mirror and you see this guy running down the middle of that running down the middle of the lane, you're like, whoa, something about this just don't look right. So you need to be at least conscious enough and at least aware enough of what's actually going on from whatever level. And that way maybe you can get you some sage or or get you some whatever just to make sure you have some quote unquote general protection or make sure that you pray right or make sure you get you some anointing oil, make sure your pastor pray over it or whatever to anoint your head. And I think that's a, that's a big thing. We have to be at least aware, but we just want to turn blinders to it and say, well, as long as I don't mess with it and they just doing that up over there, it ain't never going to affect me. It doesn't work that way in business. You just can't say, as long as I keep doing my own thing up over here, then I don't have to worry about that because it's not going to affect me. That's not what happened in 2008. You know, it's funny. <laughs> when the market crashed, everybody got affected. You know, it's really interesting, I like these maps and stuff, because yeah. I got someone, um, whoa, 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 let's go back. Okay. D. Hectorix, uh there are 54 countries in Africa. Saudi Arabia is not one of them. Actually, if you go way back, that's right, and look at the land bridge, mm-hmm. it is. That's right. See, Educate yourself. But one of the things is that they try to separate themselves from Africa. But I, even, even King Abdul Abziz, because remember, I've been in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I've been there, so this ain't this ain't something that I'm reading on the internet. I've actually lived in this country, so I can I can I can tell you stories about living there. But the king himself. Is quoted as saying that this is Africa. They, and I think at some point in time they even called it like the northeast extension of Africa. So they was they was they was given a they was actually breaking down from a science standpoint, you know, the land and the terrain and uh, the things that exist here. And basically they were saying that this is Africa. Oh, yeah. I I'm just these are the Saudis, and the Saudis are very yeah, the Saudis are interesting people. A lot of that stuff. Now you know, well, sadly we're gonna have to let this go. Because, you know, we're up on the hour mark. Yeah. But uh, we, we would definitely have tied back because uh, <laughs> this is real interesting. Yeah. And this is just something new that I'm doing where uh, next, like, you know, the girl had a grow house. I don't know if she's going to come on. Okay. But Ooh, that's gonna be good. Um, I'm going to try to hook that up. And, you know, just more interesting, more, you know, different type of videos. Because you're like, I'm not trying to sell anything in this video. You, you can have fun. I think, you know, he, he just came with a lot of knowledge. <laughs> a lot of knowledge. <laughs> so be sure to subscribe. I'll catch you guys later. And uh, this has been Realer Than Real. Hit that share button, too. It has been way real. It is funny. So with that, I'll catch you guys later. Like I said, be sure to subscribe. And we be out.